The Why Me Project, an exclusive presentation of Faith Strong Today. We talk not for profits. Yep. We talk to people who are just doing amazing things. And I think partially, maybe one of the things when I came across our desk, Holly, was uh, talk about addictions and recovery and substance. And when I was kind of reading through Shirley's stuff, I'm like, this is the person that we need to talk to with people who have struggled or maybe are struggling. Yes, because we hear quite frequently in the news about the opioid crisis and Mm. just uh, especially coming out of the pandemic. So many people felt lonely and lost and were turning to substance abuse. Yeah, no, it's true. So uh, without further ado, as we're going to dive into the life of and that is uh, Shirley Lockadu. How are you? Very well. Thank you so much for having me on your show today. Yes. Thank you for saying yes. Nothing is better than a Southern accent, Shirley. I've just, if you want to talk for the next four hours, I'm just going to sit back and listen and I'm going to be okay with it. As long as you don't make fun of me. No, I think South, I think sitting on a porch, drinking sweet tea, that is the South to me. Yeah. Well, that's great. I like to do that too. Yeah. That's our stereotype. tea. That's, it's not iced tea like we have up here in Canada. Shirley, we like to ask a skill testing question because we never know where it's going to go. And that is, who are you and where did you come from? Well, my name is Shirley Luckadoo. I grew up in North Carolina and uh, in a little town called Cliffside. Went to college in North Carolina and uh, got into education. Spent 30 years in community college education. The Lord called me to retire. Leave behind also, in addition to my education, some problems with substance abuse as a young adult. And he wanted to use that for his glory. And so I got into uh, Celebrate Recovery. Our pastor asked us if we would come and start that ministry. And we are celebrating our 18th birthday tonight. Ooh, wow. Ooh, yeah. Not a birthday. That's incredible. Right. And I've got 30 years of sobriety at on May the 4th, so there's a lot of things coming together during this time for me personally, as well as for our ministry. Yeah. Oh, that's incredible. I mean, a lot of people will have um, different notions about what a substance abuse is and how it presents. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's just dive into your story. How did you even get into a position where it became a substance abuse situation for you? Well, I grew up in a family with a lot of substance abuse. I declared I'd never have it in my home. But when we graduated from college and my husband began to to be invited to all kinds of social events, he was in sales. And what began is, let's just have a little social drink, gradually drew, grew to a daily use. And a daily use began to get out of hand. And I think that happens to lots of people. Another problem I had is I had a lot of anxiety issues as a young child, so I self-medicated a lot. <laughs> it was a, it was a way of taking the edge off, and mm-hmm. when I was anxious or when I was wanting to fit in, I would drink, and then it became not just an occasional thing, but a daily problem. Yeah, I was a very functional alcoholic, so was my husband. We had good jobs. We were. We were hypocrites. We were active in a church. We, you know, we really were. We were active in our church. But part of my problem was I had a very false perception of who God was. Yeah. And it was when He began to heal me from all this that I really began to to grow a very, very deep, strong relationship. Not just a head knowledge, not just a serving thing, but a real head, real heart knowledge so changed my life changed my course changed my trajectory of where i was going and what i was going to do and led me to the best years of my life was faith always a big part of your life no i did not grow up in a christian home i was saved and i've never doubted my salvation at nine in a vacation bible school yes (laughs) and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, good christian women led me to jesus I did not actually start attending church regularly, though, until I was a teenager and started going myself. So there again, I did not have the benefit of being raised in the church. But I also felt God wooing me, and I wanted to be in church. And started when I got able to drive, I started taking myself 
That's where I met my husband. And he was unlike me. He was really raised in a Christian home, strong Christian home. And that drew me to him because that's what I wanted. I really wanted a strong Christian home. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding, especially if you didn't have that kind of security when you were growing up. And then um, it's interesting how when you're looking for that spouse, sometimes you're looking to fill those holes. And yet, exactly right. You know, it's exactly it's right. truly only Jesus who can fill those holes. That's right. I was a very quiet, timid little soul, and he was outgoing and funny and uh, bright and came from a background different from mine. So we, I guess, opposites attracted. But it was yeah, he was sort of God wooing too. He was he was pushing us in that direction. Never doubted my marriage either, although we had some hard times during that addiction time. Yeah. Oh, I can only imagine. So you both were uh, addicted to alcohol. Yes. It was not just me. It was both of us. In fact, when I finally ended up in a bad situation and uh, the Lord told me if I did not, well, one of my children was in trouble with it too you know if you if you model that in the home and then you have teenagers they're 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 going to do the same thing you do and so he had some issues and the lord basically said if you don't get your own sack together uh, your family's falling apart yeah and i did not easily i won't tell you that was easy but he was faithful and so uh my husband eventually came along too yeah the two of us together then were invited to start Celebrate Recovery 18 years ago. Yes. Yes. As a team, so, it was, we were a ministry team. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, though, what was that point where you're, so you see your, your child also following in your footsteps. Was it more of like a, a God aha moment, like bolt of lightning? Or was it over that mm. season where you're just like, I need to make changes, no. but it's going to be hard? Yeah. It was much more dramatic than that. I spent an evening trying to get this person out of jail because he had been stopped for a DWI. Oh. A real slap in the face. Yeah. A very, very painful moment, a very startling moment, a very whatever you would call it. Yeah. Parents of teenagers who have them uh, wander into addiction or other things, it's, it's hard, especially when you know you've probably contributed to that. Oh, yeah. And then how did your church family react? Because here you are, these model Christians at a church, and now you're, again, a child at a jail for a DUI, and they find out that you have an addiction, too. You know, no one no one even confronted us with us, but I will tell you that it was not long after that till we moved physically from our home to, um, well, another, another big problem we had was not just addiction. We were trying to have a foot in the church and a foot in the world, and we were all caught up in st- the stuff of this world. Mm-hmm. It's all about success. It was all about big fine home, cars, etc. So when we uh, when we finally came out of our addiction, we also began to change our lifestyle. We moved to a smaller home in a different community because of my work, but uh, turned out to be the best move we could have made. Joined a church, and it was in that new church where. Uh, over time, Pastor knew our our issues that he came to us and asked us if we would start Celebrate Recovery Ministry. So that church has loved yes. us yes. and adored us, and we've in turn adored them. You know, they have been extremely supportive of what we've done in ministry. So, yeah. Because that's, I mean, that's one of the hard things, though, is that coming to church and then saying, hey, listen, we're theoretically supposed to be a church that we're all wounded and we go to church as one. But mm-hmm. there's so much judgment that goes on that for you to have your pastor saying, can you do something about that? That's got to actually feel real honoring for you and your husband. Well, it was. As I said, that was not the church where we were initially, but it was the church we went to. And God right. has put us there for a purpose. We didn't know it at the time. It was going to be what, 10 years before we were in that church, before we actually began that ministry. But we were not secret about our problems. We talked about our problems. And the church at the moment we went there probably was more in the judgmental mode. But after hmm. 18 years... It's a very loving church. Our uh, 
we are also involved in Capstone Recovery Center. It's the location where the women go every Sunday. They have been embraced. They have been involved. So the church is a different place, too. Uh, the church, I mean, obviously, Christ came for the sinners. <laughs> yes. And all of us are, but some of us are more willing to admit it. The first time I admitted my problem, I was actually at a retreat. And uh, we were we were looking at how to do a support group ministry. And the leader asked us to tell our stories. And I thought I'd choke before I told it because it's very difficult, especially if you've been in recovery a while, to tell the truth. Mm. But now I have found that being transparent, what God wants us to be, and it's out of that transparency, too, that people will come to the ministry and be a part mm. of the ministry if you yourself can be transparent. There's healing in talking about your stuff. Yeah. That's well, what people are looking groups are about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people are looking for authenticity and a place right. to belong and not feel like their problems are are special or mm -hmm. too big for God to Brought. to forgive. And there and and to get rid of that shame and that guilt, God Christ erases that for us, but we still want to hang on to it sometimes. Yeah. In fact, often he wants to clear clean us up from all that. He's given us a new life. Uh, we're new creations. We're his masterpieces. So uh he can take all the mess. I mean, look at the scriptures. Every single person you can look at yeah. had some kind of flaw. They were not flawless. Not a single yeah. one except Christ himself. Yeah. Just different kinds of flaws. Yeah. Do you think do you think it makes it easier for you to be involved with uh, addictions counseling to be involved with addictions ministry because you came from that because you see it firsthand what it did to you and your husband and your family? And I mean that's what would, that's what drew me to it. I wanted right. to do a ministry that would help people and prevent it. So uh, without a doubt, that's helped in the ministry is to help people to be honest with them. I work uh, every week with some ladies at Capstone Recovery Center in addition to what I do at, at Celebrate Recovery. And uh, to be authentic and to be real helps them to get real and to be willing to talk to you. I mean, they don't want to talk to you sometimes unless they yeah. know you've walked this walk too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever say, no, I don't want to enter into ministry? <laughs> that's just... That's too hard. I don't want to talk about this for a living and support people who are, you know, struggling with the same I thing. I mean, I, there have been things that have come along, uh, even, well, this may be inappropriate, but I'm going to just say it. When Joni talked to me about coming on podcasts and talking about it, I thought, no, I don't do that, Lord. But, you know, he kept saying to me, do it, do it. And yeah. I found out, ooh, I have a good time doing it. So uh, it's really... He is, he is a God with a sense of humor, too. He is. Yes. He is everything. Yes, he is. Sometimes and, we just got to get out of the boat. Right. We do have <laughs> to get out of the boat. And we have to realize that if he said, do it, he's going to go with us. I yeah. think sometimes about poor old Moses. I can identify with him. I don't want to do it. I just don't want to. And I can come up with six excuses. But he walks God always. Yeah, God always has an answer for our excuses, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. He says, <laughs> as you said, just get out of the boat. Yeah. Just do it. So when it comes to the uh, different ministries and that, that you're involved in, what does that look like? Like, what would a day-to-day -day look like for you? Because is is there a difference between one with the other? Uh, is there a difference working with men, working with women? Well, I, oh, tonight... I'll be going to celebrate recovery. And I say, we're going to have a big birthday party because we're 18 years old. There will be yeah. men and women there, about 75 people and kids. Wow. We, we have uh, uh, ministries for children and youth in addition to adults. We worship together. Then they'd go to small groups by gender so that men are with men and women are with women. So this yeah. is today uh, on Thursday, I'll be going to a Capstone Recovery Center where I teach classes in the morning. And in the evening, I'll be going to Hope House where we have a meeting where I'm, I'm 
the executive director of that ministry, which mm-hmm. is for women who have completed a recovery program but need a place to live. So all of them are working, yeah. and they uh, just needed a place to stay till they get their feet on the ground and can go reestablish relationship. And uh, then Thursday night, I'll be going to the homeless shelter where we do celebrate recovery. And there'll be men. There's usually more men there than women. But we have men leaders. I don't do this by myself. There is a team of 30, 30, 30 people who help cook, who help all of the things that have to be done. So it's not like this is not the Shirley show. It's just that uh, God put me in the role of helping get these things started. And then the, the leadership emerges and they do their part. Kind of the, if you build it, they will come. That, yeah. That's sort of the way it is. Although I will say in the early days of, of these ministries, it takes a while. It takes a while to get people who will, number one, help minister. And number two, even come until they know you're there. And so yeah. there were some early years when we, we didn't have very many people there, but now they come. Yeah. So when you and your when you and your husband were dealing with uh, substance abuse, was it both of you at the same time who decided enough was enough, or was it you then him or him then you? No, it was. But we were both struggling. I came right. to I came to uh, to leave it behind first, and then we started going to AA for his benefit more than for mine. Right. When I was in AA, I told the Lord, I said. There needs to be this. This ministry needs to be in the church. And lo and behold, unknown to me, a guy named John Baker at Saddleback Church had yeah. created uh, Celebrate Recovery in the church. It's a twelve-step program, but it acknowledges Jesus Christ as the higher power. Yeah. So. Well, let's talk about celebrating recovery in the sense of all the stories that you have seen. You've got your true stories of people in recovery book that people can go through and and just soak up the stories of healing. Um, What are maybe some of your favorite stories or your favorite story of recovery? My favorite story in the whole book? Can you pick one or is that like picking your favorite child? (laughs) That would probably be like picking my favorite child there are stories in there of, of not just people with uh, alcohol addictions there are two stories at the beginning of the book a man and a woman one raised in a christian home one not who found recovery in jail hmm. so i hmm. love that but i also love the stories of there's three in there of women who were in depression and struggled with sexual abuse as children, which yeah. just drug them down. So as they entered adulthood, yeah. suicidal. And then one of them got into drugs. The other one did not. So I love that story, those stories, because it talks about how God meets us in all of the pains of our lives. There are two in there of people who struggled with grief issues. Um yeah. Two of them, uh, one of the, one of them, a woman had two, two children die within a year of overdoses. Mm. And, uh, she declares herself codependent. And that was part of her problem is trying to rescue these people. And yeah. uh, that's a big problem too. Most people who have addiction in their families want to rescue their addicts and you can't do it. God can. And so I love those stories. Um, there's a story in there of my, my colleague who had addiction issues. Uh, she was raised in Cuba, came to this country, ended up in Florida. And uh, now she is the executive director of uh, Capstone Recovery Center. That's wow. a story in itself of how she yeah. had a dream in Florida. We had a dream here in North Carolina, and we all came together at our church and started Capstone. So. There are lots of stories in there that I like. When it comes to you, though, decide like why did you decide to write this though? Because is it because all these stories needed to be shared, or did you feel like it was put on your heart that Shirley needed to write a book? Yeah. Well, I st- it started in 2011. Okay. And I was going to celebrate recovery, and uh, 
the Lord seemed to tell me as I would listen to these wonderful stories of how he had taken people's lives and transformed them that I needed to start recording, writing some of these down. Hmm. My husband and I even did some traveling and we would get stories from other places in the country. My vision then was that it's going to be from all over the country. But as it turned out, by the time I finally was obedient, I had a I had a car wreck and oh. uh, broke my neck. What? And the Lord set me down. I mean, before then, I was always so busy. I just, just didn't think I had time. And for three months, he put me down to write. And I started mm. writing. And I started recording some things. The first book that I wrote was not this this one. It was another book called Beyond Coincidence. It was right. about stories of myself. But then when I came, then it became just really impressed on me that he wanted a book of stories about people that he had healed, that mm. he had transformed. Because it's not about the people. It's not about me. And in fact, I am merely the editor of the book. The stories were written in the words of the people themselves. And all I did was go in and polish it and edit it and bring it together and get a publisher. So uh, they're not my stories. They're their stories in their own words. So my takeaway from this is listen to God the first time. Otherwise, you might break your neck. <laughs> well, I, don't, I wouldn't say he broke my neck, but he he allowed it. Uh, you know, I think he allowed Job to get in the mess he was in. <laughs> True. Uh, you know, he allows he allows people to have difficulties, and uh, I really did. When I sat down I, for three months, and I thought, well, now's the time I can do this writing I've been going to do. I never yeah. didn't necessarily think, well, the Lord did it to me, but after the fact, I thought, well, it surely did help. It helped that I got on the right. Once I started writing, sort of like this thing of speaking, I really liked it. Yeah. yeah, I really embraced it. There you go. God calls us to things, and we don't necessarily think we're going to like it. We don't want to do it. Uh, we don't have time. And then suddenly we do. I love that. So when when going through the stories, how important is it to, I, I mean, keep keep it real? Uh, but you also, like, did you change names? Were there certain parts of the stories that were taken out just because of the rawness of it? There were three people who chose to have their names changed for family okay. reasons. Mm -hmm. So sure. there are three people in the book that did not want their names used, but wanted their stories used. Uh, yeah. The rest of them said, fine, use my story, use my name, use my story. Um, did I take out anything for the rawness? I don't remember that being a thing. Um, I think people knew they were writing to be put in a book. So they took yeah. out some of, if you heard their stories as they gave, every one of these stories was first of all delivered at a celebrate recovery meeting. And it might have mm. been a little raw they, sure. because you get more real in a small group of people that you know and you know they love you. But uh, if there was any need for taking anything out, they took it out. I did not. Uh, all I yeah. did primarily was just polish it a bit. And, and um, put it in the book. I say that too, because I mean, with Holly and I doing this for the last seven years, there are some stories that get real. And sometimes yeah. it's, you know, I don't know if we should have that in there just because of how real and how raw some things could be. And it just, you know, and the anonymity sometimes where people, I mean, your face is, is on this just like everybody else's. So it, it does make it a little bit tough. Now, uh, do you find that with you doing these not for profit, working with them now and celebrating 18 years, has it, and Holly had mentioned and alluded to it at the beginning of this, has it become busier now with different forms of addictions because of where we are post COVID? When I first started in this, most, most what we dealt with was alcohol. <laughs> mm. Now, now it's opioids would be at the top. People, young adults are getting so, uh, so involved and let's just try this now let's do a little meth and the little meth leads to the cocaine or the whatever it might be so yes i would say the the nature of substance abuse counseling and recovery has has changed over time due to the culture and what's going on in the culture um it's not unusual to have people come and say i od'd 10 times or you know and you think how wow. have you lived or else they've got 
they've got dear friends that over overdose and didn't make it. Um, yeah. they've, they've, so that's, yes, the nature of it has changed over time. I, I think as to what the substance is, but what people are abusing, uh, prescription drugs, people ab- abuse those. Um, and alcohol still around. I'm not saying it went away. It's legal. Yeah. And I read just this morning that 48% of Christians use alcohol occasionally. Well, occasional use is not a problem, but when it becomes your idol, and, and idolatry is the thing. It becomes your idol. Mm. It's what you worship. It's what you've got to have. It's what I can't leave behind. And you'll pick that over your children. You'll pick that over everything. And uh, so there, I think, is the big problem. Yeah. You've heard a lot of stories and you've shared stories, uh, and it seems like you're meeting people in those valleys. Just as you reflect in your own life and looking at some of those valleys and mountaintop moments, has there been one particular why me moment that stands out to you where you ask God, why me? Why why are you putting me through this or why am I going through this? Well, the most difficult thing that I that we have experienced as a family and um our grandson died six years ago in a very tragic mm. shooting accident. And that, to me, is the hardest thing we ever went through, losing a child. He was 22. He was handsome. He had it all together. He was, you know, and that was the most difficult thing. And the night he passed away, I read Job all night. Mm. Because I was trying to understand. And Job asked over and over and over and over and over and over, why, 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 why? And God yeah. told him at the end, who are you to ask me? <laughs> I'm God, you're not. Mm-hmm. But when when Job finally forgave the people who had made his life so miserable with all of their accusations and so forth, God restored him and he restored it. Not that he restored the exact same children he lost or the possessions, but at any rate, he restored his life to even more than he had. So. Yeah. Uh, I guess that was the most difficult moment. And had I not been more mature in my faith at that point, I don't know what I might have done at that point. But the ultimate thing, I had to ask myself, Lord, what purpose is there in this? And the purpose that came out of it was that it enabled my family, my son and his wife. Oh, it was so difficult. But hmm. he is the men's counselor at Celebrate Recovery. And in his men's group, he's got three other men who've lost their children. And he's able to minister to them in a way that uh, he couldn't do it otherwise. What if someone is struggling right now? What if, I mean, we talk about we talk about the recovery side of things, but maybe there's somebody who's listening who is dealing with an addiction or knows somebody who is. What uh, words of encouragement, what advice would you give to maybe somebody who's listening? Well, my word would be hope. There is hope. There's always hope. And that hope is in Jesus Christ. I would encourage hmm. you, first of all, if you don't have a relationship with him, then that's the beginning point. If you work 12 steps of recovery, step one says, I am powerless over whatever's going on, my addiction. Number two is there is somebody that's more powerful and he can do it. And number three is to turn it over to him. That's the most important thing. And then I would encourage them to find a support system. That's what Celebrate Recovery does. They don't, they don't cure anybody. They don't fix anybody, but they provide a support system. There's somebody there to talk to who's gone through some of the same things you have. I would strongly encourage them to get involved in a, in a recovery program of some sort and, and, and faith based. This research shows that faith based recovery programs are well, celebrate recovery. I'll quote theirs. Uh, Rick Warren says, if you come and you, and you stay focused and stay committed, 85% can leave behind whatever it is that's bothering them. Mm-hmm. And even the federal government, the Institute of Health quotes something like 75% of people who complete faith-based programs are successful. 
So get yourself into a faith-based program of some sort, a recovery center, a church, find somebody to talk to. But number one, turn your life over to Jesus Christ. Start reading the word. You've got to read the word. People don't know the word. People don't even know what's right or wrong. They really yeah. don't. They're like the people in the book of Judges, they say. Um, you know, I, I'll do everything right in my own eyes. Well, my own eyes are going to take me off to a bad place. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh. No, it's good. I appreciate you. Uh, true stories, people in recovery, com. Love for you to uh, jump online and uh, check out her website. Shirley, I, I'll be honest. This is everything that I, the only thing that I was missing was some sweet tea, but I am so glad that you took some time to share your heart today. Well, I have enjoyed it very much. I'll send you some sweet tea if I could. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like we need to do a road trip. Okay, Johnny. Uh, I love that idea. Yes. Shirley, was- thank you. It's it's been a blessing. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Projectors, for being with us every step of the way over seven years. Yes. Now we are on all the socials, including TikTok. We're going to reach the kids. (laughs) Uh, Or something. I don't know. Facebook. Yep. uh, Twitter. Instagram. TikTok. X. YouTube. X. Pure Volume. um, MySpace. ICQ. We're on it all. And if none of that resonates with you, you can always check us out at faithstrongtoday.com.